Do I need to know Git? Is it different than GitHub? Git seems confusing and poorly made. Why would I need to know it? I know the basics of Git, is that enough? These are commonly asked questions. And if you're a developer or an aspiring developer, you absolutely need to know Git and know it well. If you want to get a job as a developer, you'll almost certainly need to be skilled with Git. In this video, I'm going to address why it's essential to know Git or to learn it in 2023. I'll then walk you through the order to learn Git in, how to learn it more effectively, and how to do so easily. I will also share with you my set of tips and tricks to learning Git. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Tim Corey, and I've been a software developer for over two decades. I'm a self-taught developer who struggled through all the dead ends, missteps, and conflicting information in my journey to really understanding how to be a great software developer. Now I spend my time trying to make it easier for others. This video is just one of many resources that I have to offer. Here on YouTube, I have almost 500 videos, including videos on Git and GitHub. I also have other free resources, as well as my paid courses on my website, IamTimCorey.com. If you want to be prepared for the real world as a software developer, I can help. Now, let's dive into why should you learn Git? And I get some pushback on this because people don't like Git and it seems confusing. I absolutely understand it. Just as a before you even get started, I want you to know that for a long time, I avoided Git. And when I was first a developer and I first started to learn, I didn't use source control at all. I copied and pasted code or I created zip file backups. And you've probably done that too. And it seemed like it worked for me. And I felt like I didn't need anything else. But when I really figured out what Git was, at first it was confusing, it was frustrating, it seemed like it didn't make sense at all, and it had a ton of keywords that I just didn't understand. But when I finally grasped how it worked and what it did, it really kind of in, made my life easier, made my life better, and it made me a better developer who could move much, much faster. So I think it's important. So let's get into why I think you should learn Git after me kind of turning around where I was not, did not want you to learn Git originally. When I was first learning, I said, nah, we don't need that. Now I think we, it's essential. So let's talk about why, why is it important to learn Git? Number one, it's the number one source control on the planet. So let's get this out of the way right away. Git is just one type of source control. There are other types of source control out there. However, Git is the number one by far number one source control on the planet. You may have a different source control you love. That's great. That's awesome. But i tell you what, if you go and talk to anybody and say, what source control do you use? 99% of people will say Git. If they use any source control at all, it'll be Git. When you think about where to um, get code on the web, where are whole projects hosted? The number one answer to come up with is GitHub. Well, GitHub is the hub for Git projects. It's for Git. So Git is the number one source control on the planet. You should know just because of that. You'll have to interact with those open source projects. You'll have to interact with maybe creating your own projects. So you should know how to work with Git. Number two, it makes you more marketable. So let's say from instance, you decide, hey, I wanna be employed at some point in the software industry, or maybe I'm working a job where I don't use source control, but I wanna change jobs at some point. Most employers, a lot of employers, now, some employers are using old systems. That's fine. I've had people argue, no, we're going to use this old system until, you know, until we can't anymore. I get that. But a lot of companies, a lot of companies are using Git source control. So if you don't know Git, you are reducing the number of companies that you'll be a good fit for by a significant margin. So knowing how to use Git is pretty much a, you just have to have this in, on your resume in order to be marketable to as wide an audience as possible. So again, go back to number one, it's the number one source control 
um, system on the planet. Therefore, it's the most common source control you'll find in business. Therefore, it's something that you need to know if you want to get a job somewhere else. Number three, it makes working with code easier. This is one that, again, at first I didn't realize just how limiting the the copy paste or the create zip file backups or other systems I was using, I didn't realize how limiting that was until I started using source control and using it well. Because once I started learning to use it well, we could do things like, hey, you know what? We've got this old .NET framework project, but we'd really love to upgrade it to .NET 7. Can we do that? And you know what I'd do? I, it, when I, before I'd say, I don't know, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll take a backup of it and create a zip file of it and then we'll try it. But then we'll have a bug fix come through. We have to go, you know, dump that out and delete it and, you know, bring the old one back and it creates a mess. But with Git, I could create a branch. I could try the upgrade, see what works, what doesn't work, what breaks, what doesn't break, see what code I have to fix, bring just those code fixes over to the main branch. I could do all this stuff where I could try things out knowing I'm safe, knowing that I'm not going to break anything permanently. And so you can try things. You can try the upgrade and figure out, you know what? We can easily go to .NET Core 3.1, but that's it. Well, do that then. Go that far. And you've tried it, you've verified it, you've tested it, and you can bring that over into your main branch and all of a sudden you're done, or you can redo it. And if something goes wrong, you can roll it back very, very quickly. So it makes working their code much easier. It's a safety net. So learning Git just because of that safety net is going to speed up your processes. Number four, it's an essential developer skill. That's just what it is. Um, it's one of those things where if you don't have this tool in the toolbox, your toolbox is kind of lacking. You, you kind of need to have this as a developer. It doesn't matter if you're just working on your own. This is one of those things where um, I have a ton of projects on my computer that will never see the light of day. They're just for me or they're just for practice or they're just for my internal team. And for anything I want to keep, I put it in source control, even if it only lives on my computer. That way I can roll things back. Again, it makes working with code easier, makes me faster. So it's an essential skill you just need to have. So learning Git, yeah, it's essential. It's one of the things you have to do as a developer if you want to be marketable, if you want to work with a team, if you want to be faster with your code, if you want to interact with open source, if you just want to use GitHub as a repository for your code, even private or public, if you want to work, use Azure DevOps, if you want to do DevOps in general. Uh, these are all things that require you to know how to work with source control and specifically Git. So it's pretty important. I would highly encourage it. Can you be a developer without knowing Git? Yes. Yes, you can. Absolutely. There are developers out there that are listening to this video right now and they don't know Git and they're still developers and you can still do that. And there's still companies that don't use Git or they use a different source control, but there are smaller pools. Again, going to number two, the biggest pool are the people that use Git and GitHub or, you know, Git at least. So knowing how to use Git is pretty important. Um, it makes you the broadest available marketability that you can be uh, with just one tool. So that's why you should learn Git, but let's talk about how to learn Git because it, I, I will tell you, it does seem intimidating. I absolutely understand that it takes some understanding to really understand kind of the brilliance of how it works because it really is a brilliant system and those keywords are super scary. They actually mean what they say to me. And so once you learn how this thing works, the keywords start to make sense all of a sudden and you go, yeah, I, I kind of get that. I know why it says fork or why it says clone or why it says pull and push. And I get that. And it, kind of makes sense once you really understand how Git works. And that comes through learning it in order and then practicing it well. So let's talk about the learning order. First off, the basics, okay? You know how to install Git, how to update Git, where the command line is, uh, the basic commands even of Git and how to find out how to get help with Git. Just the basics of understanding Git. 
But after that, the basic commit flow. This is one that, again, people try and jump in to the, the absolute deep end of the pool with Git. And then they say, oh, I'm, I'm so confused. I get that because you're in the wrong end of the pool. Start at the shallow end and work your way towards the deep end. So with a basic commit flow, just learn how to create, how to move things in a staging, how to create a commit, how to maybe push that commit up to your GitHub repository, whatever your, your remote repository is, and how to pull changes back down to your local repository. So stage changes, commit changes, push and pull. That's pretty much it. Do the basic commit flow. We're not even talking about branching yet. Just learn the basic flow and get comfortable in that basic flow. And after that, then talk about branching and merging. So, you know, when you first start off, you'll have a main branch and that'll be it. And so that, that basic commit flow will just be commit directly to main and then push up and pull down, you know, from main on GitHub. But then once you learn branching and merging, okay, then start creating feature branches or uh, bug fix branches and do the work there and then merge it back into main and then push that up and then pull down. And that basic flow, get used to that as well, okay? So you're kind of building on top of each other. You're not trying to do all this at once. You're doing it once you've learned one section, then you move on to the next. So get used to that flow. but. What we have not talked about yet is about working with anybody else. Because I want you to start by just working on your own. Just do this for some projects. So you might do two or three projects with just the basic commit flow, okay? And that's it. And then you might do a two or three more projects with just the basic commit flow and branching and merging, and that's it. And then after you've done that a few times, then start working with a team or even um, acting like you're working with a team, or maybe you log out and log back in as somebody else and do some work. So you can, you can even simulate this, but working with a team means things like um, creating pull requests and reviewing pull requests and cloning and forking and the things that have to do with, you know, interacting with somebody else, merging file changes or merging uh, commits together and figure out how, those different commits, you know, we, we, you've learned how to do the branching and merging where you're merging your changes into main, but that's not a big deal. That's, that's still stuff that's done, you know, locally and there's not gonna be many conflicts there. But when you start working with a team, now you're gonna have conflicts and maybe even try to create those conflicts where you both change the same file and see what happens and see how to resolve those and start to learn how to do the comparisons where you're doing the file merge where you know, Git says, I can't do this. You have to do it. And so you figure out how to take, you know, parts of their changes and parts of your changes and merge them together into a, a final merged uh, commit. And so learning how to work with a team is kind of like the, the, the top end. Learn that last. That's the deep end because that's where you're going to get the most issues, the most things where you have to say, what, what do you do now? The, things seem broken. How do I fix them? Okay, so that's the learning order is do that last because that's the stuff where you're gonna have the, uh, the most complexity and you want to have the basics of the basic commit flow down cold. You want to be comfortable with branching and merging. You want to have the basics of working with a team down cold and then you start to get into this more complex stuff where you start to have the, the issues and you already know most of what's going on. It's just that little issue that's the problem. But you have a lot of a foundation to work off of. Okay, so that's the learning order. But let's talk about the learning steps. Because I think that the learning steps are important to know how do I do this step by step. We've already started to talk about it, but let's get into it. Number one, learn one level. I've given you four levels to go through. You might even break this up into smaller levels. If you find, hey, I can do this little piece of that level, that's fine. But learn one level at a time. Don't try and do, you know, don't try and dive into the deep end of the pool. Learn one level at a time, gradually get deeper. Use a GUI to do just that level of work. Okay, so a GUI is a graphical user interface. 
things like uh, Git Kraken or uh, GitHub Desktop or VS Code has you know one built in or uh, plugins to make it even better. Um, there's many different types of GUIs out there. Pick one and use a GUI to do just that level of work. So you're doing the you know the basic commits, then do just the basic commits. Don't try and do fancy stuff. Just the basic commits in that GUI. All right. But once you've done that for a little bit and you're comfortable and you started to feel like, yeah, I got this. I got this. This is this is making sense. Do it again with a command line. Now, people push back me a lot about the command line. They say, Tim, I don't need to know the command line. I have a GUI. I don't know how many times the GUI has failed me. I don't know how many times I've had a problem where it's like, I'm not sure where they've buried this setting, but it's in here somewhere. I know it is, but I can just go to the command line and in two seconds, pop that command out and be done. The graphical user interfaces are really just a skin over the command line. If you understand the command line, then it will make your life so much easier because GUIs have to bury stuff in menus and in under you know certain click clickable areas or whatever in order to try and get everything on the screen. And they do a great job of, of showing you visually how things work, but they often have quirks. They often have areas that don't make sense or, and this is even worse, they do an update and change everything on you. And all of a sudden now the thing you used to do isn't there anymore. It's, it's somewhere else. You have to figure out how to get back to that. Visual Studio, if you use that, they're notorious for this. They just can't seem to figure out how to get, get into Visual Studio in a way that's consistent. They keep changing things. And so, you know, they keep moving your cheese and all of a sudden you can't figure out the cheese is, is anymore. And you're like, how do I do this? If you've learned the command line, you don't get stuck because you're like, you know what? I can always fall back to the command line. I can always just get this done, figure it out later, try a new GUI if I have to, but I can get the command line for now and get that go. Because I tell you what, when you are in a serious project, when you were under a time crunch at work, and you just have to get this thing done, you don't want to spend 20 minutes figuring out why the GUI is not working or researching where that that uh, feature is now or if they've taken it out of your GUI. Uh, you don't have to figure out how to download a new application and get it approved through IT and all that nonsense just to do one little thing. So this will be important in your life at some point. So learn to use the command line. So use the GUI first, get to know how it works, and then use the command line to do those same things. So you get familiar first with how it works and then get familiar with how the command line does the thing that you've been doing so far. Okay, so the command line isn't that hard. Once you understand what's doing, once you understand the keywords that's doing, okay, I'm, I'm doing a push now. Well, that's just get push. And I'm doing a pull now, well, let's get pull. I'm doing a commit now, let's get commit. Um, and there's, you know, there's options and features and all the rest, but learning the basics of the command line will be important. So do that next before moving up a level and repeating. Okay, so that's the encouragement is learn one level at a time, use the GUI, then do the same thing with the command line, and then move up once you're comfortable in that level. Once you go, yep, I got this. I've done it, you know, five, 10, 15, 20, 50 times. I'm pretty comfortable at this level. Then move up one level and repeat. All right. So that's the learning steps. Now, um, next up, we're going to cover the easy path and then we're going to get into tips and tricks. So let's go to the easy path. And if you've watched any of these other videos, I've got lots of different videos on this, uh, or lots of different courses that cover the easy path. But for this one, it's super easy. I've got one course, get from start to finish. And that's gonna get you the stuff you need. In fact, I'm not gonna read over all this stuff. This is just part of what this covers, okay? This is just part of what's in the course. 
Um, I had to take stuff out because it was too long. It wouldn't fit on a screen without being super tiny. Um, but this is the stuff that we cover and we go into more depth in and get you really diving deep into understanding how Git works and practicing it and trying it out and understanding what's actually going on. The, the Git keyword section, there's lots more keywords besides what you see there, but the Git keyword section, uh, we talk about each of these things and understand what each is doing and why. And so we, we talk about why, you know, why fork? Why, why do we even call it fork? Well, there's a, there's a reason for that. And here's what it's doing and why. And rebase, and how does that even work? And what's, what's the logic behind rebase? We talk about that. And some of the stuff that's kind of complex. And we talk through, there's a whole section on fixing Git problems. This again is a deep end of the pool kind of stuff. This is near the end of the course. But we talk through, and there's more than just what is in this list, um, but we talk through problems like handling merge conflicts. Um, if you want to update a commit or move a commit, let's say you create a commit on the wrong branch. What do you do? How do you move it? We can do that. Um, undoing file changes. You know, talking through the different GUIs for Git and how to use them and, and seeing what they do and what the pros and cons are. Um, lots of stuff in here um, that is going to be helpful and it's going to be in the order that goes from easy to more complex, you know, the, the shallow end of the pool to the deep end of the pool and gets you comfortable swimming the whole way. Okay. So that's the easy path. You can find that I am Tim um, get from start to finish. It's there if that's what you need. Now I do have content here on YouTube, so you can go to YouTube, my YouTube channel. My, there's a search for all of YouTube and there's a search from just my channel. If you use just my channel search and search for Git, you're going to find um, a couple of videos on Git, some videos on, a video on GitHub and so on. You can just watch those, you know, and if that's good enough, then that's great. But I would highly encourage you to practice. I would highly encourage you to learn all these things and all the rest of the stuff I cover in the course at some point soon, because the more confident you are in Git, the more confident you will be in this area of software development, which is going to make you a better developer. And it's going to allow you to integrate with other teams really well. Okay. So that's the easy path. Let's talk tips and tricks. Now, number one, practice is an extra. It's essential. Now you've heard it before. If you watch these videos before, you'll know that's kind of like a burned in one uh, because practice really is essential. And it's one that when you are learning a topic, you often are tempted to skip over. Please do not skip over this. Practice is essential. This really is what separates the developers who succeed from the ones that don't. It's the reason why even for junior developer roles, companies ask for three to five years work experience. They're not doing that just to be ignorant. They're doing that because what they're really saying is, I need someone who's practiced. I need someone who's done this before because that's essential to any role. And really what separates a, a person who's a junior developer from a senior developer is how much practice they have. And yes, that usually comes from work experience. It comes from, hey, I've been doing this for a decade. I know what I'm doing. But it doesn't have to be from an employer, but you need to have practice and you can give that to yourself by just setting yourself up for success by doing that, those practice, that practice work. You can do something as simple as creating documents, a to-do list and putting it in a Git repository locally. And then you can get practice with every time you make a change to your to-do list, you commit that change. And then you can give that to-do list to your family and say, hey, why don't you add to my list as well and see if you can train them enough to be able to start adding commits with changes or at least changing files. You can teach them how to use the, uh, the GitHub commit um, right on the site so you, they can do it very, very easily. But now you have changes that are coming in. They're going to cause merge conflicts and how you deal with that. You can do something as simple as that and practice Git. So 
you can practice Git, you can give yourself some experience just by using it. Number two, learn the command line well. I know I've already talked about this, but it's important. I'm going to repeat it. Um, learn the command line well, because that again will set you apart as a developer. It will set you apart as a user of Git because the people who depend on a GUI are really hindered because they may not have that GUI at a different location. Let's say that you are working um, with a company and they use GitHub Desktop. Cool, great. You're using GitHub Desktop all the time and that's all you know. You don't know the command line, you just know GitHub Desktop. No problem. But then you decide, you know what? I'm going to go to this other company because they're going to offer me 25% more a year and I'll get, you know, other perks. And you go there, you know, do you know Git? Sure. I know Git. I use Git all the time. Cool. And you do, but you know the GUI, you know, the GitHub desktop GUI. And you go there and you find out, well, they don't use the GitHub desktop. They use Git Kraken. Well, that's a totally different GUI. And so you're kind of limited. And you kind of have to figure out where everything is. And you'll have to do that either way. But when you know the command line, you, you can just at least drop down the command line, and get something done while you get up to speed. If you don't know the command line, then you're kind of stuck until you figure it out. And so your, your startup time is slower at that new position. And you'll come across some roadblocks, kind of, you know, create some stumbles or create some slowdowns or create some problems when you're in the first six months or first year of that job while you're trying to figure out what's going on or how do I do this in this tool. With a knowledge of the command line, that won't be as limited. Okay, number three, try to create problems in testing. This is one that seems counterintuitive, but when you are doing test projects, embrace problems. Don't run away from them. Actually try to create them because when you try to create problems where let's say you create merge conflicts, create them intentionally, figure out how to resolve them because that's part of practice. Part of practice is learning how to do it in a safe environment where if everything blows up, no big deal. You don't want the first time that you have a merge conflict to be when, again, your boss is breathing down your neck and saying, we need this out by four and it's 355 and you've got a merge conflict and you're like, what do I do? It's not time to go research. It's not time to go practice. And you really don't want your first time of practicing to be in production when you have five minutes to go to get this done. So create the problems in testing, go Google, Google the, the problems with Git, you know, um, Git problems and figure out what, what problems there are and then try to recreate them and then try to resolve them. Because the more you can do in practice, the more you can do in testing, the more confident you will be when these things pop up in real life. And then with that, make notes to yourself. You're not going to have these, some of the more, you know, smaller problems, some of the more um, obscure problems every day. You're going to have those once in a while. And whatever you do once in a while, you forget. So make notes for yourself. Once you figure out how to, how to do it, make notes for yourself and say, when I encounter this problem, this is what you do. And then just keep that note somewhere. These are all my get notes. You know, this is all my, you know, get problems and how I solve them. And then that way, when you have a problem, you have a playbook to go back to. So make notes for yourself. Number five, don't run away from problems. Kind of, this kind of comes back to number three and even number four, don't run away from problems. If you have a problem, there's going to be a solution that is the kind of the, you know, kill it and, and restart it kind of thing. Don't do that if you can help it. Try to solve the problem. Don't just run away from it. Don't just, you know, scrap the thing and start over. Don't avoid the problem. Try to resolve the problem. Otherwise, it will always be a problem for you. You will always have that problem coming up again and again. Figure out a way to solve the problem. 
learn from that, make notes for yourself. That way, when it comes up again, you can solve the problem. And then number six, this kind of goes against number five a little bit, but remember, you can always go back again. You can always get out of what you're doing. So one of the things that kind of blows people's mind is if everything goes poorly and you've really messed things up in your local Git repository and you have a remote repository, you can just go a new folder and clone that repository again and kind of start fresh. Now, again, don't run from your problems, but if you're in a hurry, you can do that and kind of get around some problems and you can still keep your old repository and then figure out on in a later time how to resolve that problem. You know, you don't have to, you know, upload the prop fix, but just figure out how, what went wrong and how to fix it for next time. But you still have at the same time been able to move past that by cloning it somewhere else. Remember, when you commit something to Git, that's in history. If you ever find out, oh no, I made a change in this file sometime in the past six months that is now causing a bug. You can go back and look at the history, look at everything that's changed for that file, figure out where it was changed, when it was changed, why it was changed, and even roll back that change for just that file or just that line using Git. So you're not, you're not hurting yourself if you cause a major problem. The only times there are some catastrophic problems, okay? If you don't have a remote repository and you delete the local uh, Git folder, well, yeah, you're gonna cause some problems there. Um, you can cause some corruption things, but for the most part, you have a way to get out of any problem you've created. So just remember that there is an out. So don't get so uptight, don't get so stressed out. Remember there's an out but don't run away from your problems either, okay? So that's my tips and tricks for working with Git and for learning how to learn it well and learn it in a way that's going to really stick with you and be the most effective in for you, okay? So yes, Git is important. Yes, I think Git's essential. Yes, I think you should know Git. Hopefully, um, if you don't know Git already and you wanna be a developer or you are a developer, you'll learn Git in 2023. If so, please feel free to use this path to learning Git, and I wish you the best of success in 2023. Thanks for watching, and as always, I am Tim Corey.